the back. You good? Right. <laughs> right. So, good afternoon. Um, I just want to say a thank you to Elmaz, Woven and Kirklees and also Nat and Rowan themselves for inviting me here to talk about my research. Um, my name is Hannah Schofield Lee, as I've just been introduced. Um, I'm a Masters by Research student at the University of Huddersfield. What I'm studying specifically is Huddersfield's dyeing history and changing dye stuff's preference. For this presentation, I plan to provide a basic history of dye stuff preference and usage in Huddersfield through the 19th century, and then give a quick overview about my current exhibition at the Coe Valley Museum that you should all come to, because it's really good and it's really fun, <laughs> and we need the money, um, <laughs> and the research that I've gathered from it. Right, so, little about myself, um, I'm from round here, I'm just from Golka, which is in the Cone Valley region at the west side of Huddersfield. <coughs> now, I studied for my undergraduate history degree at the University of Liverpool, and I came back here to do Masters in History because I wanted to come home. Um, now, as part of the Woven Festival, as Rowan has sort of already explained, I received a Woven, woven Scholarship, which covered my fees for a Masters in Research, and um, well, I was very lucky to get it. Now. So my research for this master's revolves around natural and synthetic dyestuffs in the Huddersfield region. Their usage in industrial manufacture in the 19th century, the impact in Huddersfield's environment, um, and also the changing perceptions surrounding them. My thesis has largely been sorted around the four sections you can see on the screen, all the research from archival sources, secondary literature, and using this exhibition that I'm using to gather primary information from attendees, only with their permission, of course. So, first thing we need to define before continuing any further is what actually is a natural and synthetic dye stuff. For my research, I largely classified synthetic dye stuffs as high concentration chemical substances created in laboratories that wouldn't be naturally found. You won't find them on the ground or anything like that or in plants. In comparison, natural dye stuffs can be found naturally occurring in our environment. Chemically, there is no difference between synthetically and naturally grown dye stuffs as both are composites of different chemicals. Natural dyestuffs have been used for thousands of years to dye with, but synthetic dyestuffs have only been around since about 1856, after the discovery of William Henry Perkins found that colouring dyes can be derived from coal tar. Now, I've included a few differences between the dyestuffs on the board, but what I want to draw your focus on is the environmental impacts of both synthetic and natural dyestuffs. Natural dye stuffs are considered to be more eco-friendly than their synthetic counterparts um, and being generally less problematic if accidentally spilled on the ground or released into the local ecosystems. However, it is relevant to note that in my research into 19th century Huddersfield, it had a substantial environmental pollution problem that was caused by the industrial usage of natural dye stuffs with a river commission from 1873 commenting on how the rivers were incredibly polluted to the point that dyeing companies down the river struggled to efficiently dye their goods with the same amount of water as companies from upstream, thus causing a knock-on effect where water consumption shot up the further you went down the river. Anything, no matter how biodegradable and environmentally safe, cannot be released in large quantities into the local ecosystems without there being consequences on the landscape. Additionally, when a dye stuff is natural, we have to consider that it needs to be cultivated or mined by a labour force, and there is a possibility of abuse and exploitation of the labour force. For example, in the 19th century, the dye stuff indigo, which usually you get on jeans, um, was produced largely from India, which was a country under control of the British Empire, in which indigo was forcefully cultivated and concentrated to the expense of both workers' health and livelihoods. Natural dyes are not always better than synthetics, especially when you're considering about industrial procedures. Okay, so this is only a brief overview of the history of Huddersfield and textiles for the purposes of presentation. There is a lot more detail than this, but I do not have time. I've been told I do not have time. <laughs> um, now, dyes have been used for colouring matter, both bodies and textiles, for thousands of years. Huddersfield first appears in the records for textile manufacture in the 14th century a dye house and fulling mill in Almondbury. Huddersfield really took off in the Industrial Revolution with the easy supply of sheep, soft water ideal for cleaning fleeces, and the large proximity of weavers, meaning that there was readily available resources 
to um, encourage the ongoing mechanisation of textile manufacture. Through the 19th century, as well as to the modern day, Huddersfield specialised in fancy goods that are still produced for and demanded by clients all over the world. In our landscape, we can easily see the evidence of this textile heritage. There's nowhere you can go without well, not really tripping over, but running into a mill or some evidence of textile manufacture. Additionally as well, Huddersfield contained the first educational facility to teach dyeing in this country, the Huddersfield Mechanics Institute. Got a little bit of a photo on there. So that's um, the Mechanics Institute premises from 1861 to 1885. Um, it was the first purpose-built um, building for the Mechanics Institute in Huddersfield. Now, the reason the fact that they had this class was so impressive was because up until the late 19th century, Dying was largely taught by empirical methods, usually between father and son. Experience was key, and there was a perception that no other learning, like book smarts or reading or writing, was really needed. Um, the introduction of this class represents a standardisation of the dyeing industry in the 19th century, switching from a craft taught from experience to a singular procedure that was informed by chemical theory. The Mechanics Institute, which actually is the ancestor of the University of Huddersfield, was actually started in the mid 19th century to train local workforces with the skills that could be used to innovate local industries, of which textiles was one. And with the introduction of this class, I think they achieved an ambition. So this is just a brief timeline and it's only indicative of dye usage in Huddersfield. It's only highly likely there will have been companies that either utilized synthetic dyes before the date stated on the board or continue to use natural dye stuffs long after the 1930s. Huddersfield was actually at the forefront of dye innovation, with the Reed Holiday firm being one of the first to produce aniline dyes for textile manufacturers in this area. Aniline, by the way, was the, one of the first um, dye stuffs created by William Henry Perkin. It also had numerous textile professionals training in the chemistry of dyeing at the Mechanics Institute. Now, it is widely believed that by the 1930s only synthetic dye stuffs were used, and this does make logical sense. Synthetics were considered, they were not looked upon favourably by older dyers of an older generation. Um, but it had been 80 years by this point since the first invention or the first discovery of a synthetic dye stuff. And by this point, many of the older dyers who were trained with natural dye stuffs. They retired, they phased out of the business. But then we've got a lot of younger dyes that are coming into this industry who are much more comfortable using synthetics because they know the chemical theory behind it. <coughs> and they're not trained as much on natural dye stuffs. They're not afraid to push the boundaries of color and see what they can find. Now, things as well, another thing that bucks this trend about natural dye stuffs is, so the dye stuff I mentioned earlier, indigo that was produced in India, now, it's really important to mention the fact that this was still, produ well, this was still produced in its natural form um, throughout the 20th, well, the 20th century. And by the 1950s even, natural indigo was still sold on the London Stock Exchange. It's a case of, if this natural dye stuff survived for as long as it had in such you know, large quantities and for industrial use, how many others are out there that we haven't found yet? It, so, the research here is primarily based off of documents contained in the Huddersfield Mechanics Institute archives um, collection at the Heritage Key Archives, which are just that way, um, as well as industrial dyeing manuals that are available from Kirkley's Local Studies Library. If you talk to Lorna over there, if you raise your hand, Lorna, there you go, yeah. Lorna very much helped me with this research and she can, will very much, I'm very happy, I hope help others with it as well. She can guide you towards those manuals. So the general attitudes of the Huddersfield region in the mid 19th century after the discovery of this first synthetic was very much mistrust. <laughs> um, you have to remember that at this point in time, dyeing was very much a trained craft. These dyers had cultivated recipes over hundreds of attempts from years of experience. The reluctance to utilize synthetic dyes wasn't just because they didn't want to abandon their training. Dying mistakes were costly. The chosen dye stuffs would be used up and the dye fabric would then have to be stored until it could be sold on, if it differed from the wanted end result. 
So it's a case of dyes were being, they were cost incentivized. They didn't want to do too much exploration, otherwise they'd lose money. They'd lose money and then potentially lose their livelihoods. Due to manufacturers being focused on lowering costs and increasing profits, the unwillingness to innovate and possibly waste money makes logical sense. The preference for natural seems to have only switched from preferring natural to preferring synthetic as the availability of synthetic dyes increased and thus the cost of synthetics came down. At this point as well, manufacturers, well, they realise that with synthetics, you've not got the issue of it don't rub off fast. You've not got the, the short rubbing fastness. Or, and it stays the same colour for much, much longer. It doesn't fade in the sun. And additionally as well, um, they found that you could get the same colour each time. There wasn't this whole sort of, oh, it's a completely different shade. And whoops. <laughs> so in my research as well, I found that dye literature written from the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century focused entirely on, pra focused entirely on practical applications of dye stuffs. Um, when it was talking about synthetic dye stuffs, it was written by people who were young, this younger generation of dyes. It wasn't this older generation who, well, by the 1930s, as I said, they'd phased out the industry completely. The degree to which these innovations were carried forward by this younger generation, though, are debatable. Because, um, as I've sort of talked about before, standardisation of chemical industry meant that people were learning chemical theory when they were learning about dyeing and they were purely informed by chemical theory and this sort of allowed them to this allowed them to select scientific method and scientific procedure when dyeing such as you weigh out your ingredients you do health and safety precautions etc etc stuff like that but then i found numerous articles from the 1920s complaining <laughs> about the younger generation and talking about how, oh, they're still measuring stuff with their hands. I mean, health and safety violation there, but still, it's that sort of thing. So it's debatable as to how much this did happen. Great, so now onto the exhibition. So just to let you know, this is still very much ongoing at the Kern Valley Museum. I will be there tomorrow. It's open on the weekends, it's 12 till four. Uh, Kern Valley Museum is just in Golka. It's three pound for entry for adults and it's free for children. <laughs> I need to market it. I'm told I need to market more. <laughs> There's a few different bushes you can get there. Um, anyway, so, now this is the dye and remedies garden that the exhibition is meant to accompany. This was created using the seed fund that was provided for by Woven and is currently very lovely and blooming. The plan is to actually keep this garden after the end of the festival and to explore what other dye stuffs we can grow in it and then, you know, take them, chop them up and throw them in a bath and see what we can use to dye some yarn. So the reason I've included this is because in discussions with volunteers at the museum, I found out that after renovation work of the museum itself in the 1970s, they actually found dye vats buried underneath the croft, under those flags <coughs> over there. And the only reason that I actually found this out was because I was talking to one of the original museum volunteers. This is. That's why it's always best to chat to people. Chat to people until your barriers fall off. <laughs> now, the issue is, this recollection could easily have been lost to time if not for this chat. Um, this is symbolic of a lot of practice in the dyeing industry, um, or, and especially in the history of the dyeing <coughs> industry. There is a lot we don't know because it wasn't written down to prevent industrial espionage, as well as dyes just, well, it wasn't the perceived need to write things down. Now, by using this exhibition as a prompt, I intend to collect these different snippets of oral history and people's connections to dying, either for exposure in daily life or direct practice. I want to collect these memories before we lose them forever. So the exhibition itself contains a lot of information regarding the sourcing of commonly used dyes from the 19th century, such as logwood, cochineal, and indigo. And I wanted to place the industrial usage of these natural dye stuffs in Huddersfield to represent the fact is our textile industries were connected all over the world. The supply chains were very much interconnected. We weren't just like a little local village there. It was very, very international. Now, native natural dye stuffs were not extensively used in Britain's textile manufacture, likely because many of the dyes that can be gathered here take immense quantities to achieve any vivid colours. In comparison, many international natural 
dye stuffs, they provide much more colour, much more exciting colours for much less effort. Now, got my local history exhibits on the bottom right. This is from Loan from the Tolson Museum. They've got a lot of different artefacts. Um, but this is talks about John Noel. Now he was called the Tornbury Witch. He's from Almondbury. And if you want to learn more about him, I suggest you come to the exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> No. So, as mentioned before, this exhibition is a way of sourcing oral history, as well as modern day understanding and preference for dye stuffs. The information is collected at four points around the exhibition. The first being a series of counter boxes that people can drop a token in, symbolising whether they think natural or synthetic dyes are better, or even using the both token, if people are a bit more sort of nuanced about it and think, you know what, they've both got their uses, I like both. Now, following on from this vote, there is a book on the middle table that usually that asks people why they chose this opinion. So, usually after a bit of begging, um, <laughs> they usually then talk about the decision behind the dye stuff and they write it down in this book. So, the third point is a memory book, where I ask anyone who does have exposure to dyeing or stories to tell around the subject to write down in their own words what they think. And finally, I have a series of postcards on the table by the door, which anyone could submit with their details to be contacted for an interview, allowing me to take a more detailed account of their experiences with colour and coloured textiles. Now, this information is to ground my thesis arguments and provide evidence for my conclusions, especially when talking about general perceptions. It's very hard to talk about general perceptions when it's just a case of, oh, you've got no evidence. So, thought might as well. <laughs> now, the results of research from this exhibition have already been immensely helpful. Of those who interacted with my exhibition, there has been an overwhelmingly <coughs> dominant vote for natural dye stuffs, usage over synthetic, even with the inclusion of the count of people who like both and have little preference. In contributed explanations of this decision, people largely reference concerns of environmental impact, being better for the environment than synthetics, and also the softness of the shades when compared to synthetic colours. This suggests of, at least from my exhibition participants, um, sustainability and limited environmental impact are considered in fabric and garment preference, and especially in the buying of it. Now, in regards to the memory gathering, there has been much less responses, except if you all come along and like to talk about your memories, which would be great. Um, there have been amazing crackers now. <laughs> People largely talk about their own experiences and the experiments with natural dyes, what has and hasn't worked. Although there have been less contributions to this part of the exhibition, it has facilitated the recording of different people's experiences using dyes and creating colour, which personally I consider a success. And additionally, when discussing, I was asking about people to input their memories into this book. I found that quite a few people, not just volunteers at the museum, but um, people who just popped in for, for, for a look, they've been dying of textile professionals. And I've been able to identify them and ask for their contact details for later interviews to get much more information about it. So, overall, very much exhibition I think has been a success. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening today. <laughs>